And it was the first time I'd ever heard somebody basically say, when this kid's in sixth grade, they don't have a chance. And it was like, I'm going to do everything I can to prove those people wrong. So um, when I was three, uh, my dad left us. So I really didn't know um, what having a father was like. You know, I didn't even know I had a father until 12. We didn't even hear from him. Um, but my mom was a, was a missionary, you know, so she was a great person, you know, loved God. So we went to church a lot. So I learned all the core values. Um, school was tough because I was getting in trouble a lot, you know, in and out of boys' ranches and different things. Um, just just was an angry, un- angry young man. Um, he knew right from wrong, but uh, just struggled with authority in, in school. I went to college to play football in Illinois uh, for one year. Uh, it was kind of too far away, too cold. I came back and um, I went to a community college and I started taking classes for um, education. And I had to do 20 hours of volunteer work and I went to a, one of the local elementary schools, Tildenville Elementary School. And it was a predominantly low income, um, predominantly African American elementary school. And um, I started working and tutoring with some of these young men. And I think it was, I went through things in life that allowed me better to understand where they were going through. You know, growing up fatherless, all of those different things allowed me to um, just know where they were coming from. It wasn't sympathy, it wasn't empathy. It was just, I'd walked in those shoes and I knew what I needed. So I tried to provide for them what I what I didn't have. And then from that point on, I said, hey, I wanna go, I wanna be a teacher. So I went to UCF, got an elementary education degree. For the last 18 years of my life, I've, I've requested to teach um, predominantly low income, predominantly minorities, and predominantly struggling kids in math. Um, I said, don't give them to the other teacher that doesn't understand where they're coming from. Give them to me because I, I know where they're coming from. I can't convince another teacher to love them unconditionally and give them a new chance every day. I said, but I know I'm going to do that. I also coached basketball, and there was a young man by the name of Will, and Will's father had been in prison his whole life. Um, when Will was uh, finishing up eighth grade, the mom came in for a parent conference. It was like, hey, you know, hey, Mr. Schwalbeck, what, what can you do to, to help out Will? So I prayed about it, went home to talk to my wife. I said, hey, can Will come live with us? So for two years, um, Will came and lived with us when he was in high school, so ninth grade and 10th grade. And um, it was awesome, you know, I mean, I drove him back and forth to high school every day. You know, he went to basketball practice, football practice, and uh, we fished together, and um, Will was just part of our family. So there was another young man, um, Leroy. Leroy was really good friends with Will, and they were both, they both had learning disabilities. So back then they called it ESC. And Will was a really good athlete. And I said, you know, I, I, I can't wait to help you get into college. And um, what struck me was one of the ESC teachers was like, Schwalbeck, their, their IQ levels aren't high enough to be able to go to college. Like, And it was the first time I'd ever heard somebody basically say, when this kid's in sixth grade, they don't have a chance. And it was like, I'm going to do everything I can to prove those people wrong. Unfortunately, all three of their brothers had, were in prison or had been to prison. So it was a concerted effort of mine to say, hey, let me make sure these three young, these two young men don't, don't go to prison. So that summer of ninth grade, Rod ended up getting his girlfriend pregnant. So he had his daughter, Maya. So I talked to my wife and I said, hey, can Rod and Maya come live with us and we'll help raise Maya because it was one of those situations that the mom was wasn't in a stable situation the grandma wasn't in a stable stable situation so it's like hey let's let them come live with us and we're going to raise them so rod came to live with us and then leroy came to live with us it was it was the best time i mean my last name is schwalbach and everybody called us the schwalblacks it was it was funny because you know here i am six foot three 260 pounds here's leroy with dreads five seven 275 pounds and then little skinny fast leroy I mean, a little fast, skinny rod, and then little little baby Maya. So the picture, you know, when you see our Christmas card, we're all sitting there with gator clothes on, and it's just, you know, you look at it and you laugh, and it just they were they were great, great years. Um, but I started to see with them living with me, even with Will, but with them living with me, I started to see how other races were treated because. There were different things that would happen that showed me, like for example, we had a a big Suburban with 24 inch rims. 
I always drove that Suburban. I mean, I had it for, you know, 10 years. I would drive it back and forth through these towns while there were multiple times that Leroy would be driving and I'd be leaned back in the chair so you couldn't see me. So we'd get pulled over and the officer would come up because they would see Leroy. And you could tell as soon as they saw me, they were trying to justify their story. Cause it was like, well, uh, uh, you know, and it was, it was like, well, you know, my tent's never been a problem before. My taillights have never been, you know, too dark before. So I, I started to see some different things, you know? I mean, I always knew that there was, there was racism. I always knew that, that people judged different people, but I'd never seen it so blatantly that I had to then deal with it. So all of these people that are making all of these judgments about a neighborhood that they've never been into, well, come down to the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Get to know these kids and you're gonna start to realize is every young man and every young woman out there that's in school, they didn't create their situation. So every young man, every young woman out there that's in elementary school, regardless of race, regardless of income, has the same future that everyone else does, but some of them needs more support because the support isn't there. But the other thing I try to make sure I instill in these kids is, is faith. You know, I'd always share my faith with them about God's un unconditional love. And I always tell them that I would give my life to save your life. Cause we're always talking about school shootings and we have to do a school shooting drill. And I said, I would give my life to save your life. However, I have one son, his name is Tyson. Would I give my son's life to save your life if that shooter put it between my son? And they're like, wait a minute. No, you wouldn't. And I always tell them, I said, I'd give you my life because I know I'm going to heaven. But what I can't do is I can't give up my son's life to save your lives. And they think about it and they're like, yeah, you're right. But I said, but there was a guy in the Bible named Jesus and God gave his one and only son. And we talk about unconditional love. And I think at the end of the day is, <clears throat> when you read the stories of Jesus in the Bible, it's all about unconditional love. There were no conditions. It wasn't, I'm gonna love you and I'm gonna give you this if you give it back. It was, I'm gonna give you everything I have unconditionally and I'm gonna love you no matter what. And if I can love them the way that Jesus loved us and the way that God loves us, they know that and they sense that.